back into literature for uh, several decades and uh, see what was, it, what was in the minds of people in the 60s and 70s when they uh, advocated uh, uh, to the um, I have to say, I wasn't all that enlightened, but I'll share with you the, uh, the passage. And I swear I have my slides loaded and checked. See, I promise. So uh, I call this uh, a recurring, uh, recurring theme. Uh, I have no conflicts of interest relative to this topic. And uh, this is my uh, research support for which uh, I'm uh, very grateful. Uh, probably, probably the uh, key question or key questions to ask uh, in this topic are to say, what, what might you want to achieve? You have a patient at the pH of 7.15 and it's from hypercapnia, it's acute hypercapnia. Uh, what might you want to achieve <clears throat> as opposed to do you want to make the pH normal? And uh, the various kind of ideas that we will have heard sort of uh, mentioned over the years were, well, low pH stops catecholamines working. And uh, if you buffer the pH, it allows the catechol receptors to take effect. So that's certainly one theory. Uh, the second is, uh, is very definite. Low pH exquisitely uh, intensified respiratory effort. So you know very well if somebody uh, has a, any kind of acidosis that their, their respiratory effort will be extremely great. And if you can minimize that, you will lessen muscle exhaustion. You know, there's a price to pay, of course. Um, and then, depending on the nature of the patient's airway problem, they may have dynamic airway problems. So in children, you can see this very, very easily. If children often have malasic large airways. And when you sedate them, their breathing becomes a lot more easy uh, and uh, less, less um, troubled. Um, but also, a lot of patients with uh, asthma can have dynamic airway uh, occlusion also. And then there's the general idea that we know that patients, and we certainly know this, you know, the generations, patients with lower pHs, very low pHs, uh, do badly, and so uh, we're tempted to raise it in a desperate measure to try to fix the patients. So these are kind of sometimes naive, but they're reason, the reasons we might be uh, looking at this. Uh, go back to 1956, before most people were in this room were born, not, not everybody, but most people, and uh, Dr. Tenney from New York uh, did uh, a couple of series of experiments. This is in the AJP. And these are fairly cool experiments here. What you can see here is on the y-axis is increased concentration of circulating catechols. And on the x-axis, uh, over to the very last bar, is increasing alveolar CO2. The alveolar CO2 is just increased progressively. So in an intact animal, what you can see is a stepwise increase in the plasma epinephrine. And in an animal with a spinal anesthetic, and that knocks off the spinal adrenal axis, uh, that's maintained but to a lesser extent. And then an animal that's pithed, so there's no influence of the hypothalamus or brainstem, uh, the effect is, is, a, is abolished. In the same paper, they looked at the effect of the smooth muscle responses to epinephrine. Uh, the epinephrine can be increased, and you can see that as the alveolar CO2 increases, the um, response, the smooth muscle contraction, in fact, decreases. And uh, there seems to be a plateau, but there's sort of a paradox there. Now, unfortunately, this graph on the right here got interpreted to mean that the receptors don't work. Well, it probably doesn't mean that at all, because there are very many post-receptor pathways, including calcium influx and calcium activation, and that are exquisitely sensitive to low pH. And, uh, but nonetheless, these are the sorts of experiments that made people think that uh, catechol activity is, is very important. And when the catechols were the mainstay of treatment of asthma, then anything that might inhibit catechol activity or activation is certainly a therapeutic target. Uh, almost 10 years later, uh, Dr. Marchand and Van Haslett from, uh, uh, it's, uh, Van, uh, from uh, <coughs> um, uh, published in The Lancet a series of patients uh, who could describe the last resort treatment of status of Maticus. Now, the last resort treatment, in fact, was several last resorts, including tracheotomy, mechanical ventilation, uh, bronchial lavage, and antibiotics, <coughs> and um, uh, acid-base correction. 
they point out that the treating a severe status asthmaticus, the physician has to steer a hair's breadth course between the conflicting needs of the patient to breathe and cough vigorously and for the patient to obtain sufficient rest in order to be able to continue to breathe and cough vigorously. And so whether you accomplish that with morphine, with diazepam, or with bicarbonate, provided that the carbonate actually reduces the respiratory drive, uh, you run a hair's breadth. Because if you knock out the respiratory drive, they will die, because they, can't, they won't have enough strength to breathe or motivation to breathe. But if you drive them against a physical resistance or a physical set of mechanics that they can't overcome, you'll simply drive them into fatigue. And that's the kind of was the bedside management of status asthmaticus. The um, arterial blood gas analysis was uh, not widely available then, but was partly available. And the key issue there was correction of acidosis, they thought, with intravenous sodium bicarbonate. Uh, Dr. Addis, uh, a year earlier in the thorax, <coughs> uh, had linked the occurrence of coma in acute hypercapnic respiratory failure uh, to changes in pH. And this is an interesting sort of a, a correlation assessment. And what he did was he lined up, as you can see here, a whole slew of blood pHs and then a whole slew of commentaries for 10 patients. And I won't go through all of these, but what you see is acidosis coma, alkalosis confusion. Acidosis coma, not so much acidosis confusion. Acidosis coma, normal pH, rational. And so it goes on, acidosis corrected, rational, a stupor corrected, rational. And uh, basically he, he drew an association there saying, which I don't think is quite true, but you know, he was an experienced person, as expected was a prompt improvement in consciousness each time a satisfactory rise in pH was produced. And there was no relationship between the changes in CO2, and that's probably because the CO2 went off the wall every time they gave the bicarbonate. Um, what he says here is useful to read this text. It's suggested that in the situation of acute hypercapnic acidosis, there's a failure of sodium bicarbonate concentration in blood to rise as rapidly as the carbon dioxide pressure. Well, that's absolutely the core of the issue. In acute respiratory ventilatory failure, the CO2 skyrockets and the bicarbonate doesn't change. And therefore, the hydrogen ion concentration rises. That's what acute hypercapnic acidosis is. And then they go on to say, <coughs> which is uh, intravenous bicarb should be given an insufficient amount to make good this deficiency and raise the pH to at least 7.2. Well, that's fallacious, but certainly it's what they thought. And then the last point, which is a throwaway comment, but maybe the most important contribution of the whole paper, is not to forget the PaO2. But we'll leave that for the moment. One of the main writers <coughs> published many articles in the New England Journal, in the Forex, in the BMJ, and here's a paper in respiration, is Dr. Mithover and colleagues. And they published, oh, maybe six or ten articles on the use of bicarbonate in intractable asthma. And they were basically fixated on many of the core principles that I've illustrated. They publish here six cases, resistant to repeated epinephrine and ongoing ventilation, until sufficient bicarb is given to raise the pH to allow the epinephrine to act. So you can see there, I mean, it's easy to sneer in retrospect and say, oh, how naive were they? But there might have been something in what they say, but there certainly is a major assumption that they're making that is not a safe assumption, that's for sure. Because, well, we'll explain that in a moment. We'll explain that in the context, 40 years later, of a paper in chest, looking at children with asthma, Dr. Bousset and colleagues. And uh, they said that in life-threatening asthma in children, treatment with sodium bicarbonate reduces the CO2. Well, there's the CO2, and in many cases it reduces the CO2, and in many cases it raises the CO2. And I guess it depends on which child you're talking about. What they mean is, on average, it reduces the CO2. In fact, they don't mean, on average, it reduces the CO2. They mean, on average, bicarbonate was given, and sometime later, the CO2 was reduced. But not the same thing. And the pH, of course, reflected that. 
So the text here says administration of bicarbonates was associated, well that's a bit better, with a significant decrease in CO2 in 17 kids, and that's not true. It's an average reduction. And that, that bedevils the interpretation of many of our clinical trials because we assume the average in a trial is going to be the same as every one of the patients in front of us. But of course, the average is made up of many different patients who respond quite differently. Improvement in respiratory distress was observed. On the basis of the observation, they believe that sodium bicarb might be useful as an adjunct treatment. And, and the fear of an increase in CO2 is unsubstantiated and prospect of randomized trials are warranted. Maybe. But what actually happened was bicarbonate was given here in the 70s and in the 60s. The CO2 fell in some patients, and that could have been an effective co-intervention. That could have been an effect of time. That is to say, despite the bicarb, the CO2 fell. It could have been a direct result of the therapy, in that the drive was reduced, the disease status was improved, and the patient was able to breathe more effectively. That's possible. <coughs> you wouldn't bank on that in every patient, but it's possible in some patients. And it's possible, if you believe the receptor theories, that it potentiated other therapies, such as beta agonists, potentially steroids. pH or CO2, is that the wrong target? Well, in 1971, this group here, working on the, uh, the writings of Morn Campbell, of Campbell Diagram fame, who was working in London at the time, who then moved to become the chair of medicine in McMaster, uh, he said that the the physicians treating status asthmaticus with ventilators are obsessed about the CO2, <clears throat> and they shouldn't be. They should be obsessed about adequacy of O2. It's a bit like the Hickling work so many years later. And, and in this situation here, uh, they spot here, they blot out the, um, the uh, patients with acute hypercapnia, chronic hypercapnia, and uh, neither, and demonstrate that in fact there was a quite a high survival quite a few died as well, but quite high survival without much regard to correcting the CO2 or the pH at all, provided adequacy of O2 was targeted. The next question then is a, sort of a six million dollar question, is that does bicarb actually buffer pH? It's kind of a, a basic physical chemistry question really, and uh, here's a paper sort of really advertising the benefits or proposed benefits of FAM, uh, but it illustrates this quite well in, in a closed versus an open system. So an open system would be in a, say, a test tube where you have uh, bicarb and acid and you add them together and the CO2 is generated and evaporates and disseminates away from the system. And so you produce CO2 but you don't keep it. A closed system would be a test tube with where that happens, but there's a lid on the test tube, so the CO2 is retained. A patient with normal ventilatory function and without an increased dead space is an open system. If our CO2 production increases for whatever reason, bicarb, metabolic rate, we just take a few extra breaths, we blow it all off. If we have acute, acute hypercapnic respiratory failure, by definition, we are unable to do that. We are more like a closed system. So here you can see, uh, you add bicarb, and you get a generation of H2CO3, lots of CO2 produced, and H2O produced. The so H2O is thought to be innocuous, the CO2, because it can't escape, is retained. The fan, and this is for illustration of contrast, is absorbs, mops up, mops up the protons, and therefore this equilibration goes in the leftward direction. So the CO2, in fact, falls, consumes CO2. A group of pediatricians studied this in, a, in an in vitro system. They studied the physical chemistry of the buffering, and they came up with the following data in an in vitro flask of plasma. And the closed circles here indicate what happens, the pH and the CO2, as bicarb is added to the plasma. And what happens to the pH is nothing happens to the pH because as the, C, the bicarb is added, the CO2 rises and it rises because it can't escape. It's a closed system. As soon as they take the lid off, the level of, of pH instantly rises, becomes instantly buffered, uh, because the CO2 has escaped. The inability to clear CO2 is, has a physical basis, and a pH of 7.4, H2CO2 to, to CO2, has a balance of about, mass balance of about 20 to 1. 
but the optimal buffering is if those are in, in equilibrium. And at equilibrium, that pH is about 6.1. So the bicarbonate buffer system, although it's what we talk about all the time, is not a, a primary buffer system compared with hemoglobin and all of the other buffering systems that exist. So for bicarbonate to be able to buffer, the CO2 absolutely needs to be able to be eliminated. There's another component, because we give bicarb as 8.4%, which is very hypertonic. And that encourages egress of H2O from cells to bind the sodium. And that increases the availability of H plus and OH minus, and that lowers the pH fairly dramatically in the extracellular fluid. There also is a great sense of variability, so we shouldn't expect that a single bolus of bicarb given to a single given to a group of patients would have the same effect on all of those patients. For example, the urinary excretion of sodium is almost a fold change across patients over 12 hours, as does the urinary excretion of bicarbonate. So when we think of simplistic equations and directions as to how this will actually work, uh, we can often be completely wrong. This is an illustration here of the fairly dramatic effects on serum sodium, acute human concentration of giving uh, hypertonic uh, bicarbonate, which is, of course, why we use hypertonic saline in acute cerebral hema. It's to get exactly this effect. What about outcome? Corbett and her colleagues in... I'm sorry, I demonstrated... You're very aggressive there. But fair enough, have just a few slides left. Uh, Corbin colleagues demonstrated that um, the effect of LIBO versus restricted bicarb is a minimally different effect on pH and no impact on outcome, either positive or negative. And this is a charming but sort of weird study here by an orthopedic surgeon giving bicarb to patients, published in the BMJ. He decided that he would give patients uh, after orthopedic surgery and uh, bicarb versus no bicarb, and the idea was he thought that given the bicarb would reduce their dead space and reduce the amount of atelectasis. I, I, I couldn't understand the paper, except I do understand very clearly that it made most patients breathe more, at least until they excreted the bicarb. Here we can see the intracellular responses to a metabolic acidosis. When bicarb is given, the pH intracellularly falls because the bicarb generates CO2 goes into the cells and lowers the pH. In hypercapnic acidosis, that doesn't happen. Why is that? Because the cells are already full of uh, CO2. In the context of injury, and I'll finish up here now with these three similar slides. This is work by John Laffey, uh, demonstrating that in the generation of uric acid as a production of oxidant injury is inhibited by low pH, and if the pH is buffered, the injury is increased. The exact opposite effect was demonstrated by Sean Capels, working with Ralph Hubmeyer, who looked at the effect of buffering. Greater was the buffering, less was the residual injury on epithelial cells. And then finally, Alistair Nichol, working in Dublin several years ago, demonstrated that after giving LPS to animals that had adopted to uh, hypercapnia, that is to say they had physiologic buffering, uh, there was no impact uh, of the buffering. But when LPS was given, those animals that have been buffered had far greater levels of lung injury. So, bicarb from hypercapnic acidosis, perhaps some reasons to give it, but plenty of reasons not to. Thank you very much.